Hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 320 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron, and I'm so thrilled that you are here today as I'm talking to Juno Dawson. And this was a fantastic interview. And we talk about so many things that include things like how the love of a good dog can change everything. We also talk about specificity and getting our writing done out of the house or when we can't and being lucky and or in the right place at the right time. So please stick around for that. This is going to be a very short intro as I have been quite sick with bronchitis. This is the first day that I have been sitting up at my desk and uh, I am trying to breathe easily, but you know what? Five days flat on my back with bronchitis is still better than getting the dreaded coronavirus. So um, I'm just glad it was bronchitis and that I got good antibiotics in the system. And those are making me feel better quickly. So that's good. Um, what will I tell I know what I'll tell you about. I'm going to tell you about my friends, Anne and Allie. Um, you already heard Allie, who is AKA Mulford on the show. Um, and you know how they are with book talk. And then my friend Ann Kemp is doing something with Allie. And this is amazing. And you may want to be a part of this. I, I am not an affiliate for this. I am just super excited about it. And I am a part of their Patreon. They are now the book talk tours, the book talkers, like doctors, doctors, the book talkers. And they help people make TikTok fun for being on book talk, which is a pretty fantastic place to be nowadays. That could change tomorrow. As soon as the newest app rolls out, I'm sure we'll all leap to that. But right now it is TikTok. If you enjoy TikTok at all, if you want to find out what it is about, um, if you want to play, if you want to be a book talker over there, I would recommend checking out their Patreon. They have a bunch of different levels, a um, bunch of different amazing things that they are doing. And uh, they are book talkers on Patreon, or I made a short link, Rachel Heron dot com slash book talk because that's easy to remember rachelhand.com slash book talk that'll take you right there and um it's very very cool and i have been really really enjoying being on tiktok so if you want to see me talking about writer stuff i am just rachel heron over there i believe yeah let me search for me i will come right up also speaking of patreon it has been a while since i thanked new patrons and i have added some new stuff for writers that you may like and um a bunch of you up to your pledge and i wanted to thank you for that thank you to every single one of you patrons you are incredible and you make me feel amazing and i'm so glad that i get to help you out so thank you to mt daily and jennifer lauer and Catherine leamy and shana dubois and luisa de luca and janelle hardacre and clark huggins and um mariah fair and and then mariah fair immediately upped their pledge so thank you very very much uh emma jane heaton thank you thank you amanda gibson and mariah my friend Mariah upped her pledge. Thank you, Mariah. Uh, Deborah Goodger and Lauren Woods and Joanna Spears. Hello there. Thank you. Um, Joanna upped, upped their pledge. And uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Barbara Beck and Claire Cowder. My goodness, bumper, bumper crop. And I've also been forgetting to thank people. So I hope that you know that when I do forget to thank people, because I do that all the time, um, that you are never forgotten in my heart. I am so grateful. You can always go to patreon.com slash Rachel and look at what the perks are over there. And now I am honestly exhausted. So what's awesome is that this following interview is pre-recorded probably months ago, I believe. Uh, let me give you a little bit of an introduction for Juno Dawson and then please enjoy. Uh, the page turning first installment in an epic fantasy trilogy, Her Majesty's Royal Coven follows a group of childhood friends who are also witches and members of a covert government department protecting the world from supernatural forces. Juno Dawson is a best-selling novelist, screenwriter, and journalist. Her books include the global bestsellers. This book is gay and clean. She also writes for television and has multiple shows in development, both in the UK and the US. An occasional actress and model, Juno appeared on HBO's I May Destroy You, and Her Majesty's Royal Coven is her adult debut. So please enjoy the interview, get some of your own writing done, come find me, tell me about it. I love to hear it and happy writing y'all. Welcome to the show. I have been so looking forward to talking to you. Will you please share your name with us and your pronouns? Sure. My name is Juno Dawson and I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. Thank you. You are 
so busy doing so much. You have written so much in different genres. And I'm so excited to talk to you because this is a show about the writing process. Could you tell us, could we just jump right in and tell us what your process looks like? What do, how do you get it all done? Where and when and how? Sometimes I don't know. I'm, I am, <laughs> I, I think I'm, I am prolific. But do you know what? It's never really felt sort of beyond me because, and this is sickening. I mean, let's just be really gross right up front. But I just really love what I do. So it never, it never feels like work. And there are times when I'm on holiday or it is a boring Sunday and I'm like, I'm just going to do a bit of writing because I genuinely enjoy it. It's not like, it's not like, you know, I'm dragging myself to the desk. I, I, I enjoy spending time in my imagination and I always have done ever since I was little. Um, in terms of a normal day, um, I do, I do try to keep office hours. I do because there was a point where I realized not long after I gave up my day job, I used to be a teacher where I, I sort of realized that I could, if I so chose, kind of become like a vampire and I could go out every night and then sleep for half the morning and then kind of wake up and work in the evenings. But no. And then also as well, you know, when you go from a career like teaching, which is incredibly full on and, from 9 a.m. in the morning till 3.15 in the afternoon, you were at just the beck and call of kids. I felt a real sense of guilt, you know, to go from that to just having the, the, these all these hours just stretching before mm -hmm. me. And so I, I quite guiltily have, have always sort of just carried on working pretty much. I was going to say nine to five. That's a lie. Okay, like half nine to quarter past five or something you know it's, and I try, I try to keep it Monday to Friday as well I try to keep my weekends free and the, the only thing that I think is a little out of the ordinary is that I don't I know I never ever write from home um and I learned that very early on when I left teaching which is I get nothing done at home it just does not work so I have I go to a little very millennial communal work environment in in the town center where it's like all just trendy people with laptops and that's that's where I've written the last few now is that a co-working space or is it a cafe now it's a co-working space so I, I pay like a monthly membership and yeah and I like it because it is it, it is all people who are just there to work um, yeah. on their on their little projects all kind all kinds of projects whereas before that it kind of it was cafes actually that when I lived in London it was a members club and then when when I moved back to Brighton to begin with I was just working out of coffee shops <laughs> but I realized it was actually cheaper to have the membership to the co-working space than it was to buy three coffees a day so there you go I I was always 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 a person who wrote out always that's where I did it and I did all my business stuff at home at the desk. That's what the desk was for. It was for email and for podcasting and for mm -hmm. teaching. Um, but then the pandemic kind of shot that in the foot and I haven't fully recovered yet. There's still not a co-working space to, to really go to here yet. There is one queer co-working space that just opened up and it's the cutest thing you ever saw and no one does any work and they just talk. And I can't go oh, there. No, it's just, oh, it's no. like a party place. So oh, I can't no. That's, not, that's just co. That's not co-working. That's just co-dependent. <laughs> that's a lot of co. That's a lot of co. Yeah. So uh, what would you say that your chronotype is? If you were given your druthers, you never felt like working again. You never had to. Would you be a morning person or would you? Sorry, say again. Sorry. Would you, are you more of a morning person or an evening person? Ooh. You know, both. Uh -huh. Depending on depending on the day, actually. In in some time, some days I wake up and I'm just dying to be at the office and I get there bright and early and I just off I go. Whereas some days actually it takes me ages to get going. And actually I kind of come into come into it sort of in the in the sort of the later part, and sometimes even evenings, that there are times yeah. where, especially it's funny, especially with scripts when I'm doing screenwriting, I do like kind of like I'll be sat sort of like watching mindless television, and like a little scene will come to me, and I'll be like, I'm just gonna I'm gonna write that down now. But um, 
yeah, the, the worst, I'll tell you when the worst time is, I can definitely very clearly <laughs> identify this, the slot between three and five in the afternoon mm. where I just want to fall asleep. That's not, that's not my best time. I also, I also hate that time. That is when I try to do all of my grunt work. The stuff I don't want to do anyway, I push uh-huh. to that time slot. Yep. Why? What is your, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? It's a nice, it's a nice problem to have. Um, and it is, it is in the things that pull you away. Um, in, I mean, in the dream, and I don't think this has ever been true. I, I doubt, you know, even like kind of Donna Tarr, I, am, I imagine doesn't just get to kind of go to her ivory tower and write for sort of seven hours a day. And weirdly, one of the, the only positive things to kind of come out of lockdown was that I wasn't interrupted. Like it was great, you know. There was with the obviously once 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 the world cottoned on to Zoom, things changed. But there it was, was the really, worst. There was a lovely period where you know it really yeah. was just. Well, it was writing Her Majesty's Royal Cover. You know that that was how this novel came about. You know it was a, a child of lockdown, and um, mm-hmm. but it, it is the, the world it does feel like it's returning to some sense of normality. I think last week I had to be in London three days for different face to face meetings, and it, and it's that, and and so it is. It's about then it becomes this scrappy challenge to do you know, is it worth starting a chapter? I've got like a one hour train ride. Do I even bother opening the laptop kind of? Yeah. And then that kind of stop and start. And there is such a difference. So I've actually just handed um, the second book of the Coven trilogy to my editor. And Congratulations. Between, thank you. Thanks. The difference between those two books is, was wild, which mm. the first one I wrote from April, 2020, through to about October 2020 with very few interruptions. I remember when the co-working space did open, some people were rightly anxious of going back out into the world. You know, we weren't vaccinated at that point, but what it meant was meant that the space was basically empty. Oh, so I, I wonderful. I realized, and I just used to, and oh, I was just blessed. Just, you know, it's a thick book. And yet I wrote it quite quickly because there was just no distractions. Whereas book two, which I probably started in 2020 and I just finished now. So very yeah. sort of stop, start, stop, start, stop, start. And, you know, constantly being pushed and pulled. And, and I think what I've decided now that I've actually submitted book two, understanding sort of like the sort of the rigor of the promotion schedule, I think I'm not even going to contemplate starting book three until the autumn because this summer is just going to be touring bookshops. Zoom. I think that is, it's so, that's so sensible. That is really, really sensible. And I do love that the way that you put that, that your, your child of the pandemic, did all of these children of the pandemic are hitting the stores right now. Right. And I've been it's, hearing it's more an and more. Time. It's, it's, yes. it is exciting. All these authors are saying, and I wrote this at the beginning of the pandemic, because I couldn't do anything else. And here they are, they're in our hands. And um, it's all always something a bit different as well. I think yeah. it's such a time for reflection. Yeah. And so I think there are lots of kind of YA authors moving into adult, adult authors moving into YA, all kinds of twists and turns. Because I think people did use that period as an opportunity to try something new. And I know, yeah. you know, when, when I started How Much Is Well Coven, it was a case of, I was supposed to be writing a YA thriller. I was contracted to write a YA thriller. And it just wasn't happening. It was like pulling teeth. I didn't like writing from home. And my husband was just like, if you could write anything, what would you write? Because it might never see the light of day. None of us might ever see the light of day because we might die. Yeah. So just, you know, you might as well just write something for fun. And you and loved that's it. What this and novel you... was. And I loved it. I had the best time. Honestly, the best time. Oh, that is so, that is so inspiring. I, I'm, I'm, like I said, I, um, I'm writing a, a little witchy book right now that, I've never written in this genre and I'm just having the best time and I don't care. Yeah. I don't care. I, I, exactly. I've said it before on this podcast and I'll say it again. I have a little post-it on my computer that says, do I like it? Is it fun? If it's not. hundred percent. Why bother? And that philosophy is what I'm taking forward now into yeah. every project, which is two or three times now. I, actually, I will say which novels. My YA novels say her name, my YA novel Clean, and then Her Majesty's Royal Coven didn't feel like work for a single day and so I've done it three times now and I'm just 
unless I have that feeling, that sense of real excitement to get back to the characters, I'm not doing it anymore. I'm, I, I just, no, just, just pure joy, I think now. <laughs> Moving for the pure joy. Uh, speaking of joy, what is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? <laughs> like everyone, I do love, I love to know, I do love that new, new book day <laughs> when everything is so fresh and exciting before it gets hard. And you just like, <laughs> think of some new names. I mean, it's so exciting, isn't it? When you have a really good idea and you come up with great character names and you, you think you're onto something really exciting and then you realize you have to write it. Yes. Um, but just the moment before the reality of having to do the actual writing part, that that is, the best and you know I do I try to bear in mind you know I got my first book deal 11 years ago I try to keep in my mind how it felt to not have a book deal and how it felt to be trying to break into the industry and so even now that I'm in the position I mean I try not to take it for granted and I, I try to cling to my good fortune and and I I'm not being in any way humble or whatnot when I say this, that, you know, talent only gets you so far in publishing. And that's the horrible reality that, you know, my my first deal was a mixture of, of course, some talent, but huge, huge amounts of timing, like so yeah. much timing. Yeah. And so I try try to remember, I you know, there are lots of multiverse of madness worlds where, you know, I didn't. I wasn't still writing after 10 years and I didn't have the opportunities that I've had. So I think that's just constantly lovely. The fact that, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing something that I always really wanted to do. Mm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, could, I, should, I could just sit in that feeling for a minute. We're, we're publishing Litter Mates too. We started about the same time and I constantly... <sighs> constantly have that feeling too i know oh, that we've done so well we've done so it was, well. so many people have, it was just massively luck yeah. i was in the right place at the right time with the right book that's 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 all it was and it was a yeah. moderately fine it was not you know i'm not a, i'm not the best writer in the world i'm also not the worst but um yeah exactly speaking of good and bad can you share a craft craft tip with us of any sort not a crap tip Ooh, oh i mean it could be a craft tip. tip i want to say i want to say <laughs> i want to share a crap tip oh a craft tip um so my favorite one is to, and this was something I used to do back when I used to mentor young writers in London, is I used to, first of all, be very, very mindful about the difference between sort of concrete and abstract nouns. Um, the, the most gifted sort of 13, 14 year old writers are very into abstract. Tell me more. You know, like the the joy felt like the greatest love, the product of the celestial dream. And, and of course, the problem with things which are abstract is that everybody has a different vision of what those things either look, sound or feel like. And I think it's because we kind of teach younger writers that abstract things are kind of like deep and interesting mm. like that they they are what your writing should be about thematically like you should be writing about despair or you should be writing about you know love or joy or depression and they're very hard to latch on to or abstract and so I always I'm very you know it was a real challenge to get those young writers to sort of relate you know all these abstract feelings back to something concrete you know because we all know what it would be like to kind of crawl across glass you know and using those very concrete imagery those things which are based in the sensory world not the abstract we can all share in that experience and that I think that's why you know when we look at sort of metaphors and allegories that we do tend to you know hopefully avoiding cliche but we do tend to liken things to you know, physical sensations, you know, the yeah. love, the love burned. There's a cream yeah. fat. There you go. <laughs> There's a crap tip. You, you hit both ends of it. Perfect. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? Ooh, that's a good one. I'm trying to think. 
I'm now trying to think of what single thing has helped me more than anything else that is not thesaurus.com, <laughs> <laughs> which, which to be fair, has gone some considerable way to helping my writing career. Have you ever tried um, wordhippo.com? I don't think I have tried word. Hippo. It's, it's interesting. Another one. Yeah, it's it's not quite a thesaurus. It's kind of more like a branch out. I don't know. Try it. Word hippo. Yeah, word give hippo. it a shot. But. Oh, I mean, it's, it's a tricky one. I mean, my dog is what changed my life more than anything. How you so? Know, because, well, because with the dog, so that was, that came from, I got the dog, I think about two years into being a full-time writer. And I realized that, you know, there were days where I was living being dressed. <laughs> and that's not great I don't think that's good for one's mental well-being is to kind of I realized you know what I realized quite early I had no responsibility and I don't think that was a particularly good way to it was a bit Peter Panish and so I did sort of I went out and got myself a dog because I felt you need something that is going to keep you connected to life mm. and of course and I don't know if, if people out there listening have ever had dogs but Oh, yes. It was, I wasn't, I didn't realize how much, how much capability I had for love. And I think that was really interesting, sort of having something that, you know, you really would die for mm -hmm. takes your writing to a different level because all of a sudden it felt like I really understood that sense of having something that just relied fully on me, you know, from an emotional point of view. I know that sounds a bit strange, but actually I think. No, not at all. Prince, it taught me a lot about love and you know it, I think it's not a coincidence that you know four years later I, I met my husband and really entered into entered into the first fully grown-up balanced equal healthy relationship I'd ever had and I think that's because I had slightly learned to love and I think Her Majesty's Royal Coven and the move to writing adult fiction reflects that as well you know up until up until three years ago, I was I was writing teenage characters, going through very teenage circumstances, you know, first love, first sex, first grief, first loss. Whereas with Her Majesty's Royal Coven, you know, it was time to to write about the things that I've experienced these last five years. You know, whether that is, you know, friendships you know adult friendships going awry and loss and bereavement and you know the aging process and power and women in positions of power and so I think yeah it's funny that I can probably change back a lot of changes in my life to to getting the dog actually Gosh, what is your dog's name like therapy he's called Prince Prince Oh, that's lovely. I think that that is one of the best answers that I've heard. I like how it challenged you for a moment. And then you, then you oh, glommed gosh. onto the thing that really well, I, I, helped yeah, I, you I grow up. Given you, yeah, I could have given you lots of very practical things, you know, gosh, I mean, the internet, I suppose would be, yeah. how did people, how did people do writing before the internet? I don't know. I well, do I, not I don't know. It's no. too terrifying. Honestly, before the, well, on a typewriter, to... imagine on a typewriter. I used to have a typewriter when I was a teenager. Uh, me too, but it. that was for fun. It was. Uh, yeah, I used to write scripts on my old electronic typewriter. I don't know why did I get typewriter. When our fingers were stronger too, I know I would get mm -hmm. carpal tunnel with that. That was beautiful. Thank you for the print story. Uh, now, uh, will you tell us a little story about, actually, before we go into your book, I want to know what the best book that is that you have read recently is. Uh, okay, re recently. Okay. Or, you know, not recently. It can be, it can be older. We don't care. At the moment, I am very taken with another British author called Karen Millwood Hargrave. She wrote a book mm. called The Mercy, which is available in the United States. It's very, very beautiful. It's also about witches. It's about the witches of Vardo in Norway. So it's historical mm. witchiness. I loved a book by Francine Toon called Pine, which is set in the Scottish Highlands and is kind of magic realism a bit almost a bit twin peaksy but very ah. Scottish as well very beautiful wow and then I've also I've read an awful lot of non-fiction recently I mean big shout out to Laura Bates um who wrote the book men who hate women which is about the rise of incel culture which oh no sign me up I'm I'm fascinated bleak, bleak but vital reading. yeah I yeah I've I've come close to deciding to write an incel thriller and I just I can't 
I don't know. If, I don't know if my heart can handle it, but uh, but I want to. Yeah, read it. I mean, I wanna... Laura's Laura's book is is depressing. She's one of my favorite feminist writers. Oh, and I will say finally as well, the amazing um, the transgender issue by Sean Fay, which oh, I've heard great things. I'm so glad Sean wrote that book because it means I never have to. You know, <laughs> it really feels like one of the seminal texts. I think. Sean, I mean, don't get me wrong, it's for cisgender people, and I think that's right, because obviously there's a much bigger market for cis readers. But it feels like, you know, Renietta Lodge's Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race yeah. was an important book in the right moment, and I think that's what Sean's book is. I think it's the exact right book at the exact right time. And, and I just think Sean's book... It feels like the end of one conversation and will hopefully lead us into a new and more positive Ooh. conversation. Oh, goosebumps. What a what a stunning way to speak about it. Will you please tell us about Her Majesty's Royal Coven? I would love to. Um, so it's about five very powerful witches who have known each other since childhood. And um, we briefly see them in childhood, but we join them 25 years later when the gang is brought back together by an apocalyptic prophecy. The oracles of the official coven of the United Kingdom have foreseen the end of all witch kind. However, the problem is, is that these five old friends cannot agree with the best course of action to tackle the prophecy. And not only does it threaten to tear them apart as friends, but their actions will have consequences that will ripple for an entire trilogy. So, yeah. <laughs> and you get you get bright and sparkly when you talk about it and when you think about it. That's that's. I beautiful. do. I love it. I mean, it's very sad. I mean, obviously, I've got at some point I've got to come back and do the third one, which is yeah. But that's not today. <laughs> not not today. But I'm going to really miss them. I'm going to really really miss yeah. these characters. So. Yeah. Oh, gorgeous. Where can we find you? on the internet um i am i am at juna dawson on instagram and twitter for now we'll see what i know i haven't twitter. decided i think it might be the end might be the end yeah, you know, you know it really might you're just looking you're looking for that sign from above and <laughs> wasn't there just so um it might be time to move on but i find i find instagram to be a far less far less toxic environment anyway um, I might dip my toe on TikTok. I do have a TikTok. I never post. I just like watching the little videos. I do love watching the videos. I'm kind of a little bit addicted. It's my last social media addiction. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it has been wonderful talking to you today, Juno. Thank you so much for being on the show. I know this is your last interview of the day. I hope that you can just go let it all hang out now. Bad time. I'm <laughs> going to go make a cup of tea and watch some trash TV, which is exactly what I'm going to do. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate so it. And a happy writing.